First, iron smelters and factory owners. This is a picture of Surat, port of Surat. These are trading ships on the port of Surat in 17th century. So Surat in Gujarat on the west coast of India was very important port of Indian Ocean trade. Dutch and English trading, uh, the trading ships began using this port from the early 17th century. But by the 18th century, the importance of this port declined. So we'll talk, talk about the crafts industries of India during the British rule. We'll focus on two industries that is textiles and iron and steel. As far as industrial revolution is concerned of the modern world, these industries are of prime importance. The mechanized production of cotton textiles made Britain the foremost industrial nation in the 19th century. And when its iron and steel industry started growing in 1850s, became this Britain came to be known as workshop of the world. Vishwa Kakar Khana. The industrialization of uh, Britain, it has a very close connection with the conquest and colonization of India. We have already seen that East India Company, the interest of this company in trade led to occupation of the territory and then how things changed, pattern of the trade chain. In the late 18th century, the company was buying goods in India and then exporting them to England and Europe and making good profit. But with industrial production, the growth of this, British industrialists began to see India as a big market for their industrial product. And over time, manufactured goods from Britain began coming to India, flooding India. How it if affects or how it, have, it might have affected the crafts and industries this is what we are going to explore in this discussion. So Indian textile and world market. We are talking about textile production. So around 1750, before the British conquered Bengal, India was the world largest producer of cotton textile. The textile were renowned for their fine quality and exquisite craftsmanship. And they, these textiles were traded extensively in Southeast Asia, Java, Sumatra, Penang, and Western Central Asia. Now, from the 6th, 16th century, the European trading companies began buying India textile for sale in Europe now. And the memories of this flourishing trade and craftsmanship of Indian weaver is preserved in many words still current in English and other languages. So this is a patola weave, mid 19th century. This patola was woven in Surat, Ahmedabad and Patan. Very much valued in Indonesia. It actually became the part of local weaving in uh, Indonesia. Now the words, all the words we are going to talk about, they tell, they have their own history. So. European traders, they first found fine cotton cloth from India carried by Arab merchants in Mosul in present-day Iraq. So because of this Mosul, they started calling it as this type of textiles as Muslim. The word that acquired white currency. When Portuguese, Portuguese came to India for spices, they landed in Calicut on the Kerala coast of Southwest India. When they took this cotton textiles back to Europe along with the spices, now because of this calico, the name of this textile became calico. And this was the only name, this became the general name for the cotton textiles. So there are many other words also. Here as we see that uh, the name is very much important and we, the, every name has uh, some or the other link with the Indian textile. 
so the there was a, a book i'll show you an order book that represent english in east india company uh, which was sent to the representative in calcutta in 1730 the order that year was more around 6 lakh pieces of cloth and you'll see there are 98 varieties of cotton and silk clothes and the names as we as we just suggested you will find these names and there was you know you can say there was a dimension 20 yards long and 1 yard wide so these were the dimension of the woven clothes usually so this is one of the order book and you see here are all the prices being given the names of what we just saw there are various other 98 varieties so this is how each item in the order in the order book was carefully priced in london this would take 2 years you have to you know they have to book 2 years in advance because this the, the uh, distance was covered by ships and it took almost that time and again the names if you see very closely the pieces ordered in bulk were printed cotton cloth called shins khasa or you can say ko size ko size and bandana where does this shins came from this word this is derived from hindi word cheent cheente that is a cloth with small and colorful flowery designs from the 1680s there started a craze for this printed indian cotton textiles in england and europe and because of the fine exquisite floral design the fine texture and the cheapness if you uh, want to know more even the queen herself wore clothes of indian fabric this is the jamdani weave of early uh, 20, uh, 20th century so jamdani is a fine muslin which has decorative motifs these are woven on the loom typically in gray and white and often a mixture of cotton and gold thread was used as in the clothes which which you see here in the picture so the most common import, important important uh, and common centers of jamdani includes dhaka dhaka at that time in bengal and lucknow which is today's uttar pradesh previous state was united provinces the word this bandana which refers to brightly colored and printed scarf for the neck or the head so this has come from hindi word that is bandhna bandhna that is you know tying and dyeing this is a method of tying and dyeing this is how bandana has come again this is a printed design on fine cloth that is shins produced in masuli patna andhra pradesh in mid 19th century so there were other other clothes in the order book which I, we just saw and the place of origin like kasim bazar patna calcutta odisha charpur so these names the widespread use of these words it showed how popular were indian textile in different parts of world this is also an example of bandana design uh, early 20th century there is a line this in this orni a two tie dye silk piece are seamed together with gold thread embroidery so bandana patterns were mostly produced in rajasthan and gujarat so what about indian textiles in european markets there is a word which is going to come which is spinning jenny this is a machine by which a single worker could operate several spindles onto which threads was spun so when the wheel was turned around the spindles it rotated so by the early 18th century worried by popularity of indian textile wool and silk makers in england they started protesting for import of indian cotton textiles so in 1720 british government banned they banned the use of printed cotton textiles that is shins in england 
and that that act was also known as calico act and at that time textile industry just come up in uh, england so they have to compete with indian textiles and indian english producers they want a secure market so they want to prevent the entry of indian textiles so the first to grow under government protection was the calico printing industry indian designs were now imitated and printed in england itself on white muslin or plain unbleached indian cloth now there was a competition with indian indian textiles so there was a technological innovation which was sought in 1764 spinning jenny was invented by john k which increased the productivity of traditional spindles and then the steam engine the invention of the steam engine by richard arkwright in 1786 it actually revolutionized the cotton textile weaving now cloth can easily be woven with vast quantities and cheap but indian textile continued to dominate world trade till the 18th century european trading companies the dutch french and english made enormous profits with this trade so this company they comp these companies they purchase cotton and silk by importing silver in india but when the english east india company gained political power in bengal so it no longer had to import precious metal to buy indian goods they collected revenues from the peasants and zamindars in india and this this revenues can be used to buy indian textiles here is a sea view of the dutch settlement in kochi kochi of 17th century and you can see that as the european trade expanded trading settlements were established at various various ports the dutch settlement in kochi came up in 17th century you can see the fortification also here so these were the weaving center so just at a glance you see star shows plain white check and stripes in the plus sign the diamond shows this diamond shows the shins and the triangle shows the silk so who were the weavers weavers they belong to the to a community that specialized in weaving and uh, the thanthi weavers of bengal the julahas are or momin weaver of north india sale and kai kolar and devangs of south india where these community is famous for weaving you can see here a thanthi weaver of bengal painted by belgian painter solvins the thanthi weaver here is at work in the pit pit loom see this is a pit so there are two stages basically the first stage of production of was spinning mostly done by women the charkha and takli were household spinning instruments the thread was spun on the charkha and rolled on the takli so when the spinning was over the thread was woven into cloth by the weaver in most communities this is done by men for color textile the thread was dyed by rangrez dyer for printed cloth the weaver needed the help of specialist block printers known as chipigars so hand loom weaving and occupations associated with it provided livelihood for millions of indians but there was a decline of indian textiles orang word will come a persian term for warehouse bhandar a place where goods are collected before being sold also refers to workshop so the development of cotton industry is in britain it severely affected textile producers in india in many ways first indian textiles now had to compete with british textiles in the european and american market second is exporting textiles to england because of very high duties become almost impossible now by the beginning of 19th century english made cotton textiles they ousted indian goods from traditional markets of africa america and europe so thousands of viewers in india were unemployed bengal viewers was hit so english and european companies stopped buying indian goods and their agents no longer gave out any advances to the viewers so here is a letter signed by and given by this is a petition you can say by 
viewers and they are just saying that these orangs are closed and now they just do have no work and they they will starve for food if the company doesn't come into action so as i as, as i was saying that advances were not given distress viewers i just showed you the petition it was written to the government for help but worse is still to come by the 1830s british cotton cloth flooded indian market in fact it by 1880s two third of all the cotton cloths worn by indians were produced in britain so this affected not only the specialists specialist weavers but the spinners thousands of rural women who made a living by spinning cotton rendered jobless so handloom weaving is not uh, completely uh, you know dying at that time because certain type of work can only be done by machine for example sarees with intricate borders or cloth with traditional woven patterns so this was still in demand nor did the textile manufacturers in india produce, produce the a very coarse cloth used by the poor people in india sholapur in western india and madurai in south so these town emerged as important new center for weaving in late 19th century uh, later than this uh, mahatma gandhi movement national movement mahatma gandhi urged people to boycott imported textile and use the hand spun hand woven cloth khadi khadi became ultimate symbol of nationalism the chakma the chakra charkha charkha it came to represent india and was put by indian national Cong uh, congress in their tricolor flag in 1931 so what happened to these viewers and spinners they just found some other work some left the country and uh, then some viewers found work in new cotton mills that were established in bombay ahmedabad sholapur nagpur and kanpur so here is a picture of workers in cotton factory sirka 1900 and this is photographed by raja dindal mostly women you can see spinning department women weaving department mostly men so the first cotton mill in india was set up as a spinning mill in bombay in 1854 and from the early 19th century bombay grew, had grown as a important port for export of raw cotton from india to england and china so it was very close to the vast black soil tract of western india where cotton was grown okay. so the supplies were quite easy raw material supplies smelting there is a word going to come smelting so the process of obtaining a metal from rock or soil by heating it at a very high temperature or melting objects made from metal in order to use the metal to make something new so by 1900 over 84 mills were operating in bombay many of these established by parsi and gujarati businessmen and mostly traded with china so mills came up in other cities first mill ahmedabad 1861 then a year later kanpur growth of cotton mills led to demand of labor so thousands of poor peasants artisans and agricultural laborers moved to the cities to work with mills so in the first few decades of its existence the textile factory industry faced many problem first the competition with imported britain uh, textiles cheap so in most countries government supported industrialization by imposing heavy duty on imports that will eliminate competition and protect the infant industry or the native industries but we had a colonial government so this protection was not there okay the first major spurt in the development of cotton factory production in india was during the first world war when textile imports from britain declined because of the war and indian factories were called upon to produce cloth for military supplies this is tripu sword made in late 18th century we'll talk about this woods steel so you can see that this is Uh, written in the gold on the steel tipu sword were quotation 
from the Quran uh, with messages of victory. And here you see a tiger head towards the bottom of the handle. So the sword of Tipu Sultan and wood steel. We will talk about a story of Indian steel and iron metallurgy by recounting the famous story of Tipu Sultan who ruled Mysore till 1799, fought four wars, ultimately dying. So Tipu's legendary sword is still in the museum in England. So what was incredible about this sword was that it could rip through the opponent armor. So the quality of the sword came from a special type of high carbon steel called woods made all over South India. So wood steel were made into swords produce a very sharp edge with a flowy water pattern. And this pattern came from carbon crystals embedded in the iron. So Francis Buchanan who toured Mysore in 1800 after the death, year after death of uh, Tipu Sultan, he also left an account of technique by which wood steel was produced in many hundreds of smelting, smelting furnaces in Mysore. So in these furnaces, iron was mixed with charcoal and put inside small clay plots. Through an intricate control of temperature, the smelter produced steel ingots that were used for sword making, not just in India, but in Western and Central Asia too. So this woods is an anglicized, it's an anglicized version of Kannada word ukku, Telugu, hukku, Tamil and Malayalam urukku, that all means steel. So Indian wood steel, it fascinated European scientist Michael Faraday, who uh, is a legendary scientist, discovered electricity and electromagnetism. He spent four years to study this Indian woods. But the wood steel making process, which was wide in South Africa, uh, South India, sorry, was completely lost in mid, mid uh, 19th century. The sword and armor making industry died because of the conquest of India by British and imports of iron and steel from England, it actually displaced the iron and steel produced by craftsmen or craftspeople in India. So here is iron smelters of Pala, uh, Palamau of Bihar. There is a word going, going to come, bellows, a device or equipment that can pump air. So we will talk about amended furnaces in uh, villages. This production of wood steel was highly specialized technique of refining iron. But iron smelting very common till the end of 19th century. In Bihar and Central India, every district has smelters. Right? Uh, they manufacture or implement. It is used, the, the, iron, the ore to produce iron. So the furnaces were most often built of clay and sun-dried bricks. The smelting was done by men while women used this fan or you can say bellows pumping air that kept the charcoal burning. Then by the late 19th century, the craft of iron smelting was de declining. In most villages, furnaces were uh, not in use and the amount of iron produced came down. The reason, one of the reasons was new forest law. Colonial government prevented from enter, uh, the people from entering reserve forest. So where will they get iron smelter, will get charcoal? Where will they get iron ore? Because defying forest law, they can only sustain for some, some time. So more, many gave up this craft and they looked for some other livelihood. In some areas, the government did grant access. But the iron smelters had to pay a very high tax to the forest department. And this also reduced their income. Also, by the late 19th century, iron and steel was being imported from Britain. Iron smiths in India began using imported irons to manufacture utensils and implements. And this also lowered the demand of iron produced by local smelters. So by the early 20th century, the artisans produced iron and steel faced a new competition. What was the competition? I'll just tell you, this is the, you can say, a deserted village in central, uh, central India where the Agarias, a community of iron smelters, they lived. Ultimately, they left, they, they didn't, because of the famine, because of the various, you know, uh, hard times to survive, 
they left this work and left the villages too. Iron and steel factories come up in India. So first let me show you this picture. This is a Tata iron and steel factory, Tesco on the banks of river Swarnalekha. Swarnalekha, Suvarnalekha it is written. It's Swarnalekha in 1940. There's a word going to come, slag heaps, the waste left when smelting metals. Year was 1904, hot month of April. Charles Weld, he was an American geologist. And Durabji Tata, eldest son of Jamshedji Tata, they were traveling to Chhattisgarh. They wanted to search for iron ore. So they spent a lot of time to get it where they want to set up modern iron and steel plant. Jamshedji Tata, he decided to spend a large part of his fortune to build a big iron and steel industry in India. But they need to identify the source of fine quality iron ore. So one day, after traveling for many hours in forest, Weld and Dorabji, they went to a small village and they found men and women carrying basket loads of iron ore. These people were the Agadias. So they asked them that uh, from where did they get this iron ore? Agadias pointed to a hill and they reached the hill and they found uh, actually because one was the geologist, geologist and they find this Rajhara hills with finest ores in the world. But there was a problem. The region was dry and water was not there. So the Tata had to continue their search. But Agadias helped them to discover the source of iron that would later supply them to the Bilai steel plant. A few years later, a large area of forest was cleared in the banks of rivers this Swarnalekha to set up factory and industrial township Jamshedpur. So here there was a water near this iron ore deposits, the Tisco Tata Iron and Steel Company came up and began producing steel in 1912. Now Tisco, all through late 19th century, it came in very opportune time. India was importing steel, manufactured in Britain. Expansion of the railways in India had provided a huge market for rails that Britain produced. So for a long while British experts in the Indian Railway, but they, they were just unwilling to believe that good quality steel could be produced in India. But by the time Tisco was set up, the situation changed. In 1914, First World War broke. Steel produced in Britain now had to meet the demands of war also in Europe. So imports of British India declined. The Indian Railways turned to Tisco for supply of rails. War dragged down, dragged for several years. So Tisco had, had to produce shells and carriage wheels also for the war. By 1919, colonial government would take 90% of the steel manufactured by Tisco. And then Tisco became the biggest steel industry in the British Empire. Here is a picture. This is expansion at the end of the war. To meet the demands of war, Tisco had to expand its capacity and extended the size of the factory. So the program of expansion continued after, after the wall also. You can see the powerhouses and the boilers uh, being built in Jamshedpur in 1919. So in the case of iron and steel, as in the case of cotton textiles also, industrial expansion occurred only when British imports into India declined and the market for the Indian industrial good increased. So this happened during the First World War and after, as the nationalist movement developed and the industrial class becomes stronger, the demand of government protection becomes louder. And struggling to retain its control over India, British government, they had to concede many of the demands and in last decades of their colonial rule. So at this time, this is the early years of industrialization in Japan. I will try to emphasize the difference. Same thing was happening in India and Japan also. So the history of industrialization of Japan in the late 19th century present a contrast with India. The colonial state in India, keen to expand the market for British goods, were unwilling to support Indian industrialists. They were unwilling. But in Japan, the state encouraged the growth of industries. The state means the government itself. Meiji regime, which assumed power in Japan in 1868, 
believed that Japan needed to industrialize in order to resist Western domination. So it initiated a series of measures to help this industrialization, postal services, telegraphs, railway, steam powered shipping, they were developed. The most advanced technology from West imported and adapted to the needs of Japan. Foreign experts were bought to train the Japanese professionals. Industrialists were provided with generous loans to, uh, for investment by banks set up by the government. And large industries were first started by the government and then sold off at cheap rates to business families. If you see in Indian, Indian uh, regime, that is Indian colonial, uh, the domination created barriers for industrialization. In Japan, the fear of foreign conquest spurred, spurred industrialization. That is, one was under rule and the other doesn't want to get into any rule. Therefore, the industrialization happened. But this also meant that the Japanese industrial development from the beginning was also linked with the military needs.